have 20 minutes. Not quite. <sighs> Sorry about that. I clearly got very taken. I don't even know how that happened. Did we start late? No. Okay. Intention to create legal relations. At the end of the day, this topic is really simple. There are a whole lot of cases that you have to read. I'm just giving you the upfront. There are desk lectures, by the way, if you are listening to this for the first time, maybe listen to desk lectures because this is going to be a rollicking quick ride through. Um, but there are a whole lot of cases. Most of them are really old. Effectively, they look at when you are friends or family members, did you really intend to be in a contract or not? And mostly courts erred until relatively recently, until the 80s in Australia, erred on the basis, yeah, if you were married to each other or used to be married to each other or you were in a family relationship, we need some pretty damn strong evidence that you intended to be in a legal relationship before we're going to call this a contract. We need to see intention. And if it was a commercial arm's length arrangement, then they wanted to see some pretty hard evidence that you didn't intend for it to be a commercial relationship before they didn't see intention. Those things are called presumptions. And um, I'm at risk of just standing and talking to you in front of this slide rather than going through my slides because they seem to slow me down. But the key case in this particular topic when we talk about presumptions in particular, is the case of Ermogenes. So Ermogenes was a orthodox, let me just find a slide that deals with it. He was an orthodox, uh, Greek orthodox archbishop. He was actually in America and he got wooed across to come to Australia to uh, woo the congregation. Let me hope, I see what I'm doing here. No. Oh, and not only this, my son does this occasionally. He, um, he turns on the funny things so that, uh, I'm just gonna go here, uh, so that uh, um, it just throws me like it has then. Hermogenus, I just wanna find it. Get there eventually. <sighs> Deep breath, slow. Just taking a moment to compose myself. Um, Hermogenes, he was an archbishop. He came across from the States to be the archbishop in this environment. He got paid a certain amount of money every month, a P-A-Y-E, I think it was at the time, tax was withheld from him and paid and he had to do tax returns. Uh, he had, there was at any given time, there was a board in the church that he had to report to. Uh, he, you know, went and held old ladies' hands and officiated at baptisms, worked pretty much every weekend for no particular overtime. And after 23 years, I think in the late 1990s, he resigned and he claimed holiday pay and long service leave for that period of time. And the church said, no, 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 no. You did this as a spiritual leader. You did this because of your love of God and the Greek Orthodox community and we're not going to pay you any overtime or any holiday leave or anything like that. And he said, oh, man, hang on a minute, you actually employed me, you wooed me from the USA to come and be your spiritual leader and I did that for a really long time and I understood that I was in an employment contract with you and the laws of this country and the implied employment contract terms where I get long service leave, like 23 years, that's like two lots of, what, six months plus a bit. Basically, the question came down to, was there an intention for this to be a contractual relationship or was this a social uh, family type relationship? So the High Court have this wonderful line in the judgment where they say there is a risk of the rules ossifying, turning into a statement that if it's a family relationship, no contract, 
and if it's a commercial relationship, then there is a contract. And that is not what we want the law to do. We want the law to adapt over time. And so ultimately they said, yeah, we start with these presumptions. So a presumption is just basically a shorthand thing that the courts will use to determine a starting point. So in fact, in almost every case involving a contract dispute, there will be a presumption that there is a contract. Unless one of the parties raises the question of whether there's been agreement, whether there's been consideration, whether there has been intention or certainty. Um, and actually raises the question, the issue, is there a contract at all? Presumptions, you come across them in almost every subject. Probably the most famous presumption is the criminal law presumption. Guilty until, pr uh, sorry, innocent until <laughs> proven guilty. You can tell I'm not a criminal lawyer, can't you? Hey, but at least you laugh, that shows you're paying attention. Um, that we start, it's just a shorthand start. So the presumption is innocent, that means it's the job of the prosecution to prove guilt. In contract law, if we have a family relationship, there is a presumption that arrangements between family members or amongst friends, um, between spouses, even former spouses, between gentlemen and their mistresses, there is a presumption that there was no intention for those to be contractually binding. But it's only a presumption until the party who doesn't want that presumption to be true proves otherwise. So Ermogenes, the trick to this subject, I'm not going to go through all of the cases, they're in the desk lectures, but the trick to this subject is working out that a presumption is only a presumption. And Ermogenes tells us that what we need to do is look at who has the onus of proving that there is intention or is not intention. So if we have family members or a social relationship, then the onus of proving that there was intention falls on the person who is seeking to demonstrate that there is a contract. So in Irma Genus itself, there would be a presumption that because it's the nature of the arrangement, it's not a traditional commercial arrangement, so it, there is a presumption that it might not, there might not be intention so the onus is on the bish to demonstrate that there was intention. It is not a high bar. What he had to do was say, they contacted me in America and asked me to move here to do this. I had to report to people on a regular basis. I had reporting lines and responsibilities I submitted tax returns and they withheld my PAYE holdings from me and submitted that to the tax department. I had to get a work visa to work here. From my point of view, they employed me and the intention was that they, if, if I did the wrong thing, I could be sacked. It was an intent, there was an intention in that particular circumstance. If we're talking about a commercial arrangement, my company, your company, we decide to put on a sports day uh, for our mutual clients uh, and it's our Christmas party and somebody gets hurt and you decide that um, it was my responsibility to have the insurance in place. And I'm, it'd be my intention in that, or my duty in that case to prove that there was no intention for us to have a contract here. We were just having a sports day or a Christmas barbecue. There was no commercial contract in place. Well, I would be arguing that unless I thought you were supposed to have the insurance, then I'd be arguing the other way because that's the way I roll. Um, so, this is the quote here. Not only is there obvious difficulty in formulating rules intended to prescribe the kinds of cases in which an intention to create contractual relations should or should not be found to exist, it would be wrong to do so. Intention, 
again, and I've got to say, I really don't like the opening video for this topic, um, where Dave basically talks about presumptions and how you'll start with this presumption and that presumption, and this is how it works, because he does actually imply that the presumptions have a much stronger effect than they do. At the end of the day, the question becomes one of fact. Is there intention? It, can we point to anything that demonstrates that the party's intended to be bound or not? If we're in a commercial relationship, we're going to assume, unless somebody is going to argue strongly to the contrary, that there is an intention. And it's very rarely an issue in contractual, in commercial arrangements. But in a family or social arrangement, if uh, we have the presumption that there is no uh, contract, and if somebody wants to argue that it is, they're going to have to prove it. They're going to have to prove intention as an element. It's not a very, very high bar. So, wouldn't so the question was, wouldn't it be past consideration? I'm going to ask you while I fiddle with my slides to elaborate on that, so I understand where the question is coming from a bit better. At the beginning of the. So you're talking about in Irma genus? Yeah. Well, at the begin so at the beginning of the relationship. If it was a contract that had been taken to court, then at the beginning of the um, relationship there would have been an offer and then an agreement. Well, at the begin so what he's saying, at the beginning of the relationship, so talking about Irma genus, Irma genus sitting over there in I have no idea where he was other than let's let's put him in Cincinnati. It's there being a bishop in Cincinnati for being bishopy, whatever they do, and suddenly gets a knock on the door and says, would you like to come and work in Australia instead? We're, you know, it's much sunnier there, there is less snow, um, and we've got this vibrant Greek community. Yeah, there are more Greeks in Melbourne than there are in any other city in the world other than Athens. It's a fabulous place to work. It's, uh, we're gonna make you an archbishop. So he, and, and then presumably they have some discussions about how much he would get paid and who would cover his costs of moving there and stuff like that. And he says yes, and he gets there. So again, at some point there was an offer. They agreed a salary. They did all of that stuff. The question, so the church is basically saying, but we didn't intend it to be a contractual relationship. We just paid him because he's our archbishop and we love him. I grew up Catholic. We had to give like one hour's worth of salary or pay into the into the church bin every week. Like, and God knows what they spent that on. Like, we're trusting a man in a dress with like a amount of money, and I'm sure that he didn't pay any like um, payg or anything like that. I'm sure there was no accounting, but the Greeks. They were looking after it. They had everything down on one side. It looked like a contract. So I don't think there's a past consideration issue there. Their just argument is, okay, it looked like a contract, but there was never an intention for it to be binding. We, and, okay, let's, I'm sorry, I'm clearly falling on the side of the bishop, even though <laughs> said Catherine Nolan never. Okay, since she was about 12, but anyway, let's say, the other side is actually, he's our religious leader. It's the right thing for us to do, to pay him an amount. There are laws in Australia that say he has to pay tax. It's a crime really, because he's a religious leader. We shouldn't, he shouldn't have to do that. We have to do the compliance stuff. But clearly he's our religious leader. It's not a contract thing, like it's a love and respect thing. So you can see it. I can see their argument. I actually think it was probably something that they made up so that they didn't have to pay him long service leave, actually, at the time. But I can see a version of that where they thought, think about, has any of you ever worked in a family business? You worked in your family business? Did you get overtime? No way. Did you expect overtime? Uh, I think I was fired and employed three times in one day. Fired and re-employed three times in one day for no pay. I used to like, I used to dry apricots in a shed in 40 degree heat and everything, like with every OH&S rule ever was like broken, but I never, I, like I was bloody lucky if I got, you know, like a sly Chinese on a Friday night to say thank you. I wasn't getting any cash. Um, again, family relationships, you, you know, like there was no intention for it to be a legal relationship and I understood that. To the, if I don't know that I understood that there was any option. The option was dry the apricots and get a clip across the ear. But um, 
again, we understand how these relationships work. So I, I think if there is a contract, we need intention from the beginning and we need something that demonstrates intention. And things like the way the contract was formed will help with that. Um, uh, Woolen Mills is an interesting case here because it helps us with a test. I do like a test. So Woolen Mills, um, again, this is a contract that many, many students, uh, sorry, a case that many students find quite frustrating. But I just want to point this out because Woolen Mills is a case too where we have the government. And it's really, it's very hard to get the government to demonstrate an intention to enter into a binding contractual relationship. Policy is not a promise. Um, I think, you know, was it Bill Shorten who said a couple of years ago, oh no, it was Kevin Rudd, there are uh, um, binding, pro uh, like uh, uh, real promises and campaign promises or something like that, I can't remember the quote. There are promises, there are promises that we intend to keep and the promises that we make during campaigns. Um, and so, again, we have this kind of problem. In Woolen Mills, there were a number of aspects that pointed to there being no contract. The entity that made the promise to pay the subsidy didn't actually have any authority under statute for making that payment. So there wasn't actually a basis for them to make that promise. The person who made the announcement didn't have the authority to bind the Crown. The Commonwealth had no particular interest in the actual price of wool. It had interest in how the economy was going generally, but it didn't, and it was interested in getting votes from wool farmers, I have no doubt. Uh, there was at the time this sort of overriding understanding that Australia's uh, prosperity was going to be linked to the growing of wool, but it had no specific interest in the price of wool itself. And again, illusory promise poten potentially, the Commonwealth itself had reserved its right to vary the amount of the subsidy. So again, we link this idea of an illusory promise with intention by reserving your rights or your discretions in the making of a promise, you are indicating that you have no intention to be long-term bound. So the two actually feed together in that way. Now, what I want to talk to you about in particular is preliminary agreements, because I think as a commercial lawyer in five minutes, these are the most interesting. So I'm going to do this in rapid fire. If you need to leave, because we are four minutes to just walk out, but this is fascinating, you won't want to. So a preliminary agreement is an agreement where parties have negotiated the, uh, the terms that they have, but they are subject to con a contract at this stage or something else. Oh, we've got one hour? Yeah. Oh, I thought we were here until four. Oh! <laughs> that is so exciting. <laughs> Yay, then I'm going to go back somewhere else. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, this bloody thing. Okay. You said no. you had three hours. I did. It was supposed to be three hours. You're right, but I, th I don't know why I just had... <laughs> I, it could be that I'm just like, I've forgotten how to read an analogue watch. <laughs> that could be that as well. Uh, no, I will stay with Masters and Cameron for a second. Oh, Liam. So, go backwards. Mast Masters and Cameron, no. So, preliminary agreement. Deep breath. Sorry, I'm just consult. This is so exciting for me because it means that we get to do the really good cases, which I really like. Um, Okay. Preliminary agreement is the agreement you have before you have an agreement, effectively. Um, I work a lot in the M&A space, so mergers and acquisitions space, and so often before you get deep into due diligence and you really understand what it is that you are buying or selling, you want to have some sort of indication agreements. Often, now this is where I think I stopped you before, Will, and said a heads of terms is a particular thing that I'm going to get to. This is where we might talk about a heads of agreement, heads of terms, term sheet, letter of intent. Those are the kinds of names that we often give preliminary agreements. So that's the one pager that your client always wants. They always want it on one page. 
uh, the one pager that says who's going to buy, who's going to sell, what the price is going to be, what the, ter the, the essential terms are going to be before we get into the detail of the agreement. So the question of intention often comes in relation to preliminary agreements. Is that first cut agreement, is it binding or not binding? Now sometimes it's really clear, like a good lawyer will actually make it really clear. Again, I'm going to direct you to Encyclopedia of Forms and Precedents and get you to look for term sheet or letter of intent. You will often find that there will be two sections, binding terms, and there will be a term that says the parties agree that they will be bound by clause 1, 2, 3 and 4. Clause 1, 2, 3 and 4 are probably things like confidentiality. The fact that I want to sell my business is a secret and if you tell anybody else I can sue you because that usually upsets people and creates issues of the price. The fact that I'm interested in buying your business is a secret and I can sue you if you tell anybody else. Um, if we don't end up buying and selling the agreements and you make offers to employ any of my staff, I will sue you. That's usually a binding kind of clause. There are often others depending on what it is. If, if while I'm showing you information about my business, you end up approaching customers of mine, I can sue you. Um, or if you end up creating any products or services that look or feel or smell like products or services that I'm creating right now, I will sue you. Those kind of things. But broad things like, the price will be $7 million plus or minus the value of the sheep on the farm or whatever it happens to be. Those are things that we might negotiate a little bit later on. And so a well-drafted agreement will separate out the uh, binding terms from the non-binding terms. Unfortunately, not everybody has a good lawyer and gets that right at the very beginning. And often, it's at that point nobody wants to speak to lawyers because they're all getting along fine and they're absolutely sure that they're going to do a deal. So the question becomes often, particularly when the relationship sours down the end, did we intend to be bound by this? Is, is there some sort of agreement that we can um, in force. So, Masters and Cameron is the key case here. It goes back to 1954, it's a high court case, and it said that there are three different types of preliminary agreements. There are the ones where the parties have effectively finalised their terms and they intend to be bound immediately. These agreements will be binding whether or not a more formal agreement is signed. So a number of the cases are, set, are cases where there is a heads of terms or a letter of intent and they never ever go on to the more formal agreement because they get along fine, they transfer things, but the letter of intent itself sets out clearly enough what the intent is. The next kind is an agreement on terms, but performance of the agreement will be conditional on executing a formal document. So we've agreed the price, we've agreed all of the essential terms. The next step is that we're going to create a formal agreement and when that's signed, we will be bound. In Masters and Cameron, they found, well, if there's nothing else outstanding and the formal agreement reflects those terms, then the parties will be bound to sign that agreement. So if you really have reached agreement on the terms, but performance itself, so payment, requires the signature on a piece of paper, then you are obliged to sign that piece of paper. And then the third category is that there is no intention unless and until the parties execute a formal contract. It's not done till it's all done. Our intention is we're going to negotiate every single provision in this agreement and it's only when we are both sides are happy with each of the terms in the agreement, will it be signed? These are usually the agreements where it's really hard to say this is an offer and this is an acceptance. In fact, back in the olden days when we used to do things on paper, you would often bring everybody into a room 
they would sit there the day before and actually do a page turn of the agreement against their draft to make sure that every page matched uh, their version of the negotiated agreement. When they had finished doing that, they would put them into envelopes. I've done this many times. Envelopes or they would put something around them and then seal them together and like put a signature or a mark over uh, over the place that the envelope closed so that you would know if it had been opened, if anything had been changed. And then you would leave it in a locked room overnight and then the next morning the CEOs would come in at the same time and sit. And then it was almost like it'd be one, two, three and they would both sign at the same time because otherwise the one who signed first was making the offer and the one who signed second like might suddenly have some sort of extra control or something or other. I know it was weird, it was the 80s, we all watched LA Law, we had big shoulder pads, it's just how it worked. It was much more dramatic than it is now where you just, I'm going to send you a PDF with a watermark on it and you'll send me yours, we'll throw it into some IT system that neither of us understand. And yeah, we could do it anywhere, but we don't. We still stay really late in our offices. I don't know, it's like it's just not as much fun as it used to be. Anyway, that second time is not binding unless and until everything's agreed. Billy. Question on the second category. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that the parties are bound to perform that actual additional term or additional obligation? So, a second category is this one. So, agreement on terms, but performing is conditional on executing the formal document. So the first thing that they're bound to do is actually execute the final contract. Execute in that context means sign. So you've agreed all of the terms. The only, so we've agreed the terms. In fact, we've agreed the terms where I'm going to sell you my property. We've agreed the location, all the rest of it. We're going to use the Law Institute of Victoria standard sale of contract uh, for land. Uh, we have agreed what the special terms will be. Um, in fact, we might have even made all of that, those special terms and conditions beforehand and it's if you are the highest bidder at the auction, I will agree to these extra special terms mm -hmm. and then you are the highest bidder at the auction. Um, at that point, my obligation to transfer the property to you and your obligation to transfer the cheque, give me the money, is conditional only, let's say, on you signing that or both of us signing that contract. We've agreed everything else, we just haven't signed it. At that point we are both obliged to sign that contract and then the next, then the obligations in the contract happen. Because everything else has happened, we've agreed everything else. So you can't not sign the agreement? Well you can do anything that you like but if you don't sign it and I am, I fed up and I'm going to sue you, I will be able to argue based on the second category in Masters in Cameron that you have an obligation to do it. The reality of life is if you don't sign it and you're negotiating something else and I agree with it, we've just undone, we had an offer and accept uh, an offer acceptance situation, you hadn't actually, you've come back with another counter offer at that stage and we've, we've gone down the track. Parties can do anything that they like at the end of the day. It's not a crime not to keep your promises. Um, but when somebody gets jack of it and sues you, you, are, you would have a problem. So in Masters in Cameron we had this. This agreement is made subject to the preparation of a formal contract of sale which shall be acceptable to my solicitors. So this was the clause that became an issue. And Ultimately, oh, sorry, I thought I was going to actually have the words on there. That diamondy thing is going to really annoy me. So ultimately, here, the court found that it fell into that second category. That the terms itself needed to be acceptable to the solicitors, but once we had that, everything was agreed. We can sign away. So. Again, it's not subject to executing the formal contract. It was agreement on the terms, execution of a formal contract, which fitted over here. Okay, so now I want to talk to you about, because we've got more time and we can do it without being ridiculous, 
I really need to have to. I want to talk to you about honour clauses. Some tricky situations, because I'm going to work on the basis that you can get through the family ones, and there's a little bit of amusement there, with because most of you will have seen the Ashton and Pratt stuff go through the courts over the time, so you can see some modern examples of some family relationships. But at the end of the day, I think the um, more interesting stuff is these commercial contracts, these honour clauses uh, in a commercial context. So what am I talking about here? As you already know, a commercial transaction we have a presumption that there's intention for a contract to be legally binding and we don't usually have a problem. But there are certain kinds of contracts, um, particularly letters of comfort or honour clauses, where we can see this problem come up. Um, and parties themselves may actually, right from their very beginning, signal that they don't have an intention to be bound, so they negate the intention to be bound. So, a, we've talked about this in relation to agreements to negotiate. Agreements to agree are never binding. Whoop, go backwards. Oh, come on. I really should have just fixed that up. Um, courts will not enforce an agreement between parties to reach agreement. It, they might enforce an agreement to negotiate, they have to negotiate, but an agreement to agree lacks certainty. Um, it often happens though that parties will say, well, we'll agree that later. You often see in long contracts too, um, big complex contracts that go over a period of time, it's like, well, if when we're building the bridge, we don't get a permit to do X, then we'll agree the best way forward then. They seem like quite uh, useful clauses, but actually they're not binding. An agreement to agree lacks sufficient certainty. So you cannot sue somebody for their failure to agree with you. You can sue them for their failure to keep an agreement with you but you can't sue them for their failure to agree with you at some point. So it is worth noting that as we dive into this area. So the first, no, oh, okay, Rose and Frank is sort of a basic starting point. So Rose and Frank uh, acted as a uh, sales agent in relation to, uh, uh, so they're sales agents for farm equipment. And the parties executed an agreement where they would continue their present arrangements. And the clause of the document said, this is not a formal or a legal arrangement. It's just a record of our intention that we honourably pledge ourselves with mutual loyalty and friendly cooperation. So it said right up front, we don't intend to be bound. Um, Crompton actually terminated the agency at some point and Rose and Frank said, no, we're going to see you for that. We had built our business on the basis we were going to continue as your agents for a long period of time. Court said, no, nah, you signalled right up front that you didn't intend to be bound, so it's not our job to enforce that contract. So once an agreement is binding, you can't exclude the court's jurisdiction, but it's the court only has jurisdiction if the agreement is binding. No, I'm just sorry, I'm gonna flick through here because I want to get to these agreements. So, letter of comfort. These are, this is some real world example. So, this is a 1989 decision. Um, some of you might, some of you might not have been born, but some of you might remember that there was a little recession at the end of the, nine, the 80s. That's sort of, you know, basically Wolf of Wall Street. Oh, no, what was... Uh, I can't remember the Douglas film with the, the Wall Street film. Yes, I'm going... <laughs> All that time, lots of people were making lots of money and then suddenly there was this little crash. So, and these ca a couple of cases we're going to talk now about now came out of that crash. So, um, 
Some of you uh, might have heard of Spedley Holdings. So um, Spedley Holdings was a, an investment company. Uh, it was owned by, well, the major shareholder was a guy called Christopher Scase, who ended up, uh, I think, living in Mallorca. Yeah, sorry, where was it? It was Mallorca, I remembered. He was dying of some lung disease and couldn't be returned to Australia. A lot of investors in his companies lost a lot of money. So Spedley, I think it owned Channel 7 at one stage, actually. Uh, but Spedley Holdings had a wholly owned subsidiary called Spedley Securities. And Spedley Securities' job was effectively to invest in the stock market. Uh, so again, we've got a corporate structure here. So we've got humans who are the uh, owners of Spedley Holdings. Spedley Holdings has a number of investments. Spedley Securities is not the only one. It had a whole lot of different things that it did. Um, I'd be surprised if any of you have done any company law yet, or you have done company law, so you understand, at least one of you do, that companies have limited liability. Effectively, companies were created so that gentlemen could take risks with the money belonging to other gentlemen and be limited in their liability to the amount of the investment. So the humans who uh, own the company, their liability for things that a company does is limited to the amount of investment that they've put in the company. Unless, of course, they're directors and they break rules or otherwise. But if I give a company $100 and it spends all of that $100 and then goes bankrupt, even if it owes other people another $100, they can't come to me. That creates what we call a veil, the corporate veil. So Spedley Securities was set up for the purpose of making investments in the stock market and taking risk. And to, do, to take that risk, it borrowed money from Bank Brussels, five million bucks to go, it seems such a small amount of money now, five million bucks, but anyway, five million bucks. It's invested that money in the stock market. So um, ANI owned 45% of Spedley Holding. ANI is also a very large listed company at the time. Uh, I think it's Australian National Industries was what ANI stood for originally. Uh, so ANI owned 45% of Spedley Holdings. Christopher Scase and his interests controlled the rest of it. Bank Brussels, not a stupid bank. It thinks this, you know, investing in the stock exchange can be a risky business. We might not get our money back. So we would like some guarantees or some sort of comfort. So it went to ANI, who had the bigger bank's balance, and ANI and asked ANI for a letter of comfort. So basically, ANI was giving a promise, or in this letter of comfort, was effectively saying that it would support Spedley Securities. So I think the next slide actually has some of the wording on it. So there were two relevant terms in the agreement. So uh, yeah, ANI is Australian National Indus Industries. ANI said, it is our practice to ensure that our affili affiliate, Spedley Securities, will at all times be in a position to meet its financial obligations as they fall due. They also said, if we cease to be a Spedley Securities shareholder, we'll give you 90 days notice of our intention to do that. ANI sold the shares without telling a, a Bank Brussels in advance. Spedley failed to pay the loan. Um, and then the question became, um, was that letter of comfort something that they could sue on? Was there an intention to be bound? So in that case, the court looked at these two questions. Was there an intention in this letter for it to be binding? So do we actually have some basis on which there's a contractual right? And secondly, were the terms sufficiently promissory? Was there a promise that was made there? So what do you think, just based on what we've seen here? These terms, 
What do you think? Some of you might have read it. Anybody want to argue the reasons why it might be binding? Oh, sorry, I, uh, you put your hand up before I gave you a side, but which? I would say that um, like an, applying an objective test, if you look at the language that's presented in there, um, will at all times be in a position um, to meet its financial obligations as they fall due seems to be really clear and certain. Um, so it does have this word practice. It's our practice. Um, you know I'm going to go the opposite way for what you're leading, but all right, I can do it either way. Yeah. So uh, it is our practice to ensure that our affiliate. Okay, now I think the notice is possibly a stronger argument. Talk to me about that. What's the benefit or detriment, depending on which way you look at it, on having this 90 days notice? So what, you're, so what you're doing is saying, okay, by saying, sorry, don't, stop me if I'm putting words in your head, but by words in your mouth, whatever it is, um, by promising that they give them 90 days notice if, they, if that company ceased to be affiliate, an affiliate, they were somehow demonstrating more strongly their intention to ensure that their affiliate was at all times in a position. So, and practice, it's our practice. This is what we do with our affiliate. Anybody got a different view? Anybody got a view? Yeah, a little bit like a policy, it's practice. Practice sort of probably feels a little stronger than policy, but again, it's, this, it's the vibe. It's just a feeling. Um, So we've looked at that. Let me just move forward. So basically, there you could have been sitting on the bench there. Um, the court agrees with you. Um, it said, well, they've got a promissory character. Um, the courts need to enforce statements that have a promissory ca character when they're uttered in the course of business. And there's no clear indication that they weren't intended to be legally enforceable. So it's not like Rose and Frank and Compton, where there was yeah, we're just putting this in writing because we all love each other very much and but we're not really making any promises here. We're just putting, it's, it's the vibe. There, there was nothing like that in the document. They were basically just saying we will be bound uh, or, or this is our practice, I should say. The letter that a and I gave included some enforceable contractual promises to provide notice and so by failing to do that, um, by, by failing to do that, they failed to give Bank Brussels the opportunity to withdraw the loan. So if they'd given 90 days notice, of course, it was kind of a stupid promise for them to make, really, because both companies were listed, right? So again, at risk of stepping into company law uh, areas, but when you are a listed company, you have an obligation under Chapter 3 of the listing rules to tell the world if you become aware of something, other than a list of exceptions which you don't need to worry about, which could, which a reasonable person would, might, uh, would think would, um, might think would change the price of your stocks, whether it's going up or down. Now, if you are a listed company and you have to give a notice to another listed company that says, I'm going to sell those shares, your shares, and that listed company, the second one, Spedley Securities, has to then tell the whole market that, then what do you think is going to happen when a 45% shareholder says, in a dropping market anyway, we're going to sell our Spedley shares? Basically, share price absolutely plummets immediately. They don't get the return on their investment that they were hoping for. Uh, the share price goes down and Bank Brussels would be no better off. Right? In fact, they could possibly be worse off um, because it's, yeah, 
their, their investing company has completely disappeared as well. So ultimately they found there that the bank was entitled to damages. So let's look at another really similar case but a, contra a, con a contrasting result. So this case, same year, English case, Kleinwatt, Benson and MMC. Lengthy negotiations this time. I'll show you how the arrangement worked in a second. And, but the letter that was issued started with the words, or included the words, it is our policy, a practice policy, we've come across that already, to ensure that our subsidiaries or this subsidiary is at all times in a position to meet its liabilities to you. So very similar, but not exactly the same wording. Here we have slightly less, uh, oh actually it's probably slightly more complex arrangement. So Malaysian Metals Corporation, MMC, still around today, basically has created a subsidiary for the purpose of investing in the tin market on the London Metals Exchange. Again, they're trying to contain their risk in relation to that particular market into one entity. Um, Kleinwart Benson has advanced 10 million quid um, under a larger agreement that it has with MMC. So there's an agreement in place in relation to the financing of MMC and some of its subsidiaries, but there is also a, um, this loan facility going directly from Kleinwalt Benson to MMC. And then there are a couple of letters of comfort that MMC gave to Kleinwalt Benson in relation to this loan as well. Now, it's also relevant to know that Kleinwalt Benson said, yeah, we don't know about this tin speculation, it seems pretty high risk, we'd like to guarantee the loan. You know, we'd like MMC to give us a guarantee and MMC said, well, no, it is high risk and speculative and you are a big fancy European bank. So you can go and do your due diligence and we're prepared to pay or the subsidiary is prepared to pay quite a high interest or coupon on this. Um, we're not going to give you a guarantee but we'll give you a letter of comfort in relation to the loan and in again the, it had that wording um, these diamonds my son by the way thinks that's hilarious when he sneaks up when I'm not looking and changes the transitions on my slides um, I'm not sure that you agree because I certainly don't but anyway um, I'm just willing him to one day be in a lecture where something like that happens we'll see how we go so I think that is also relevant to why the result in this is different um, so, uh, yeah, I've told you all of those facts. Tin market collapse. Like I said, there was a little recession at the end of the 80s, 87, 88, somewhere around there. Um, and the tin market, basically the bottom completely fell out of it. And metals actually owed the entire 10 million quid at that stage. Couldn't pay. So... At that stage, um, uh, Kleinwalt Benson then said, here's our letter of comfort, MMC, you have to pay us the money. MMC so he said, no, it was just a letter of comfort. It was our policy and we're not adhering to our policy. So in the first instance, the court found that commercial people intend their agreements to be binding and the letter contained a contractual undertaking and it, as a consequence, it was effective to underwrite the subsidiaries of indebtedness. But on appeal, the court found that the letter didn't contain any such contractual undertaking. It was merely a representation of the fact that only carried with it a moral obligation on the part of MMC to meet metals debt. And if you look at the decision, they took into account a couple of things. One is they said it was their policy. Secondly, they were asked for a guarantee and they refused to give it. So as part of the structure there, it should have been clear to MMC uh, that there was no intention for them to underwrite the indebtedness. In fact, when they were asked to underwrite the indebtedness, they said no. Um, thirdly, we didn't have the same sort of scenario that we had in Spedley where there was a promise to continue to own or to maintain the affiliate nature. Now it's 100% of subsidiary and it stayed 100% subsidiary. But it was also part of the investment rationale was 
this is a risky investment. We're going to hive this off into this one place. And we've already said to you when we were going to borrow money from you, we're not going to guarantee the loan or the indebtedness. Um, and it's up to you to price when you're making an offer to lend this subsidiary money, you need to price the risk into that. Questions, concerns, frustrations. I just find it more interesting to look at the commercial transactions where there's no intention than to sort of go through one by one uh, the family relationships where we're trying to show that there is intention. And the trick, there's, this is actually one of the simplest topics there is. The trick to this topic is to understand that there is no set rule. Just because your family or church members or friends doesn't mean that you can't enter into a contract and have intention to be bound. And just because you are two commercial bodies doing a commercial deal on an arm's length basis doesn't mean that you have to ha demonstrate intention. What we have is a presumption in both cases. Unless, unless there is a reason to argue otherwise, we presume in social and domestic relationships that there is no intention. So it's a presumption and it's really easily overturned. The person who has, I'll come to you in a second, the person who, it goes really to the onus. So who, who has responsibility for demonstrating intention in a social or family relationship? The party who wants to show intention. Similarly, in a commercial relationship, there is a presumption that there is intention. So the onus falls on the party who wants to demonstrate that there is no intention to show that. And again, particularly in commercial transactions, that ultimately goes to the drafting. And again, I strongly recommend that you have a look at the Encyclopedia of Forms and Precedents, look for a letter of intent and see how they're put together because often you need a mixture of both. Things like, I want to keep this a secret, that needs to be binding, but my promise to support the underlying loan, I don't want to be bound. Sorry, Eliza, I kept talking. No worries. First of all, your battery's running low. Oh, thank you. Hmm. On that note of kind of presumption and condemning the rule, um, with on a cause of risk, would you say that there is any kind of like general rule as to whether or not oh sorry, um letters of comfort. Would you say there's like a general rule as to whether or not letters of comfort are meant to be um, As a general rule I think the short answer to that is oh good, sorry. The short answer to thank you for the battery, it does appear to be fixed. Um, as a general rule, parties don't, again, as a general commercial rule, my commercial experience is the party who is the parent company of the borrower does not want to be bound by a letter of comfort and the bank does want them to be bound and the perfect time to negotiate that is as MMC did at the time that the agreement is entered into and it's largely a drafting problem particularly since those two cases in the late uh, 80s uh, it is largely a drafting problem because we have examples of where it went wrong um, and we have language that's been clearly considered by the courts so it is a competent lawyer should be able to make it very clear which aspects are meant to be binding and which aren't it then becomes a commercial problem because the bank doesn't want to advance the money if the person who has got the funds isn't promising to support the bank. And it is having those hard conversations like MMC did where they said, well, you price that into the deal. We'll go to four or five different banks. We'll go with the one that's the best, but we're not providing you with guarantees, so you price it into the deal. Um, in relation to family situations, um, I don't think there is a clear rule. And I think you do need to look at the facts and the intentions. So a couple of the, and sorry for those of you who came in a little bit late, partly because I was, thought I had an hour that, I thought I'd used up my last hour or I was racing ridiculously. Um, we haven't looked particularly at these um, cases and I'm gonna do Ashton and Pratt in a second. But I think um, 
when you have a acrimonious family situation, so in a modern situation, so particularly when you are talking about agreements that are made in the process of a marriage breakdown, when you are talking about uh, agreements that are made in a family business situation, particularly when family members are fighting with each other, you are more likely to be able to find a contract because they only reach agreement in that kind of formal way because they don't like each other otherwise. Um, again, it's, it's not the kind of issue it used to be. I'm really having one of those days with the tech again. It wouldn't surprise me if they've just decided that it's time for me to be out of here. Oh yeah, the whole thing, it's just stopped. Give me a second to get the screen up and running. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah, and I think you need to look at the facts each time. Again, I'm not a dispute lawyer, um, so it's a little bit hard for me to speak to my experience in relation to this. Um, I've dealt with letters of comfort from a drafting perspective a number of times. I've never had any of the ones that I've done end up in court but we've spent a lot of time in sh crafting what do we need to have as binding and what's not. Similarly with term sheets for deals, what's binding, what's yet to be agreed and what's the... Because often a term sheet for a deal is a framework for how you're going to do the negotiations. Um, so I'm hoping to teach mergers and acquisitions over summer. If any of you find this stuff fascinating, we'll do quite a lot of that there. But it is the crafting of that. Um, because I'm not a disputes lawyer, I haven't seen many of those things go up in flames, particularly since those letter of comfort things. Let me show you a good example, though, of a family and social relationship. Um, Sorry, let me just do that again and get through to Ashton and Pratt again. So, um, some of you will remember this gentleman here, Mr Pr Pratt. He was the major self-made man. Uh, uh, Australian paper mills, I think, APM. Um, he, I think he was the child of Holocaust survivors, came to Australia as a refugee, uh, built a massive empire. Sounds to me like he was a thoroughly unpleasant human, but I never actually got to meet him. Um, this is uh, Madeline Pratt, uh, sorry, Madeline Ashton. She was Mr Pratt's mistress for quite a long time. She had previously been a sex worker uh, and she was also an exotic dancer and she had a brief fling with him at some point and he convinced her that she should stop being a sex worker and an exotic dancer, that he would provide her with some funding for her jewellery making business and that he would set, well this, sorry, this is what she alleges or alleged, that she would, um, he would set up a fund, she had a couple of children for their education and that he would pay her rent, set her up in somewhere that she could live uh, and so that she could just be his mistress and not have to do anything else. Um, so they reached some agreement and she made these decisions, she made some changes to her life and then Mr Pratt died without actually making any accommodation in his will or otherwise for her or her children or for these promises he made or for a number of other illegitimate children that he had. Illegitimate is a terrible word and I'm going to apologise for it. I have a couple of illegitimate children myself and they feel quite legitimate to me but I'm just using the language that uh, is being used. And his widow, uh, Jeannie Pratt, has um, fought every single one of these claims, tooth and nail, no expense spared. So I think it'll make a great teledrama one day, but um, I can imagine it has been a very, very unpleasant life to live. So um, 
Okay, so ultimately, after he died, Ms. Ashton sought to enforce this agreement between uh, Mr. Pratt and herself. According to her, it was agreed that there would be this trust established, that she was going to provide some financial assistance to the business, and that her job was to provide domestic services and companionship. Uh, Mrs. Pratt solicitors argued to the contrary and relied on an argument that agreements made in a family, social or domestic context are not intended to be legally binding. Um, so, what happened? Justice Brereton said that there were two factors here that suggested that there was no intention. Ordinary people in their position would not have intended that in the event that either did not fulfil their respective promises, the other could enforce the promise in a court. There is considerable force in the defendant's submission, so Mrs Pratt or the Pratt family solicitor's uh, submission, uh, that it would not have been envisaged that if Miss Ashton had returned to the escort industry, Mr Pratt could obtain an injunction to restrain her. I don't think legal means, I agree with this part of the decision, I don't think legal means is what he would have done at all. Um, or that if she did not fully perform her role of mistress, he could claim damages for disappointment. So these factors aren't decisive in all cases, but ultimately it was held that Mrs Ashton couldn't overcome those matters to argue that there was an intention to create a legal relationship. The court also held that contracts that are sexually immoral and or prejudicial to the status of marriage, historically an immoral purpose, are unenforceable. Personally, I, mean, I like to point to this case because it's one of the more modern versions of this particular issue, but I actually find this a really difficult judgement. I find it judgmental, and I know judgments have to be judgmental, I see the irony in saying that, uh, but I see this as being, this, there's a real power play in this relationship uh, and in these promises, uh, and I... I, I So it seems like it's a moral judgment rather than a legal judgment. But having said that, the question becomes, would that, if what we're looking at with intention is, would you sue, was the intention that you could sue if somebody broke the promise? Now, the thing is, to me, that seems like it's the right test, but it's kind of a superficial test. Because if we go back to the cases that we were talking about last week, when we're talking about consideration and we're talking about practical benefit. Now, I do not want to go down to the Robins, uh, into the rabbit warren of practical benefit and a case involving a mistress because it just will get too silly. But if we think about that, we were there discussing a case where a company made a call that they were better off breaching a contract then they were actually fulfilling their obligations and potentially going bankrupt. Not every contract that you enter into would you contemplate suing if the other side didn't keep their promise. But even though we have intention that is legally binding, the costs of going into litigation and the public consequences of doing so, when you think it through, I think intention in our, in a real sense, is probably something a little bit less than I would sue. But I don't think the courts have yet had found a way of articulating that. As a commercial person who does commercial deals all the time, I know for a fact which kind of deals where I'm working with a client that they're never going to sue particularly if you're talking about small companies borrowing large amounts of money from banks. If the bank decides to change a rate at a particular time, banks change their terms all the time. Banks do not always keep their promises, but you're very rarely going to sue a bank because you really need to have others who are prepared to sue with you because of the amount of money that's involved. doesn't mean that you don't intend 
for it to be a legally enforceable contract. It doesn't mean that you don't expect to be sued yourself if you don't keep your promises, but commercially you might never actually expect to sue. So I, I find this a problematic judgment for a range of reasons and look and I recognise and you know I do I feel for Jeannie Platt, her whole, you know, <laughs> deceased husband's life played out on the front pages of the paper all over the country, ongoing um, for for a very long time, potentially more so because of the number of legal actions that she's taken in relation to it. It's a good judgment from the point of view of it's got if, particularly if you don't want to read all of those cases, if you want a good modern summary of what the cases are and how they matter, um, Ashton and Pratt number two is a really useful case for that regard. But I do, I'm just going to put, put my hand in the ring and say that I have trouble with the judgment and I have serious trouble with, as a feminist with some of the ways that it's written. No, 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 no. There are lots of the earlier ones, um, more last century and earlier. One of the reasons for bringing this one to your attention is because it is so recent, um, and it is it's a it is a good sum up of the law. I don't don't think you can argue with the law. I don't think he needed to say some of the things that he said in the judgment, uh, but. I don't think you can argue with the law in it. So one of the very early ones, oh, I hate it when I have to remember off the top of my head and I haven't brought my notes with me, um, but one of the really early ones where there was, um, somebody might, might remind me of the name, husband and wife had been separated for some time, early 19th century from memory. Um, the husband made some promises on the court steps as to what maintenance he would pay for his wife, uh, didn't keep the promise. And I think it's Justice Aitken says the words, uh, love and affection count for so little in these cold courts. And that we should, so there is, there is a lot of that. But it's one thing to point to a judgment like that that's almost 200 years old and in fact, actually it might have been actually 1920s or something, it might be a bit over 100 years old, um, as, as opposed to this, which is this millennia. So they're the key things that I wanted to talk to you about today. Questions, concerns, frustrations, other than me not being a very good keeper of time, sorry about that. Jackie. Dick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, let's talk about Dick Pratt. Yep. Um, he obviously had an intention when and an agreement with her, with his mistress, to do whatever they did. And, but there was no, there's no legal, just because he died, doesn't that promise dies with him? So the question is, so your voice is very quiet. Um, Jackie is saying, so Dick had entered into some kind of an agreement with Maddie, uh, but then he died. So doesn't his promise die at the point that he dies? A couple of different things going on there. So as a matter of general contract law, if you make an offer and then you die before the offer is accepted, assuming that the offeree is aware of your death, so that I think it's Fong and Chili, Chili and somebody, anyway, Chili's in the name. Um, at that point, the offer lapses. But the estate, if, the, if, if you are a party to a contract, then the estate, your estate remains a party to that contract. So she, he had, let's just go straight vanilla um, understanding. He said so he had offered to invest in her business. She had accepted his proposal to invest. There's, so we've got an offer and an acceptance. The consideration was the amount of the loan. Her consideration was her promise to repay it over time uh, and to, well, let's just go in the straight commercial terms without going into anything else, you know, the domestic partnership piece. Uh, and um, 
So we have off, we have agreement, we have consideration. We have, let's say we have certainty as to the terms. He's promised to put in a million dollars. She's pr promised to repay it over five years. I don't know what those terms were. Um, but let's say we've got that. The last thing that we need in order to demonstrate a contract is intention. So his estate was arguing this is not the nature of an arrangement where there is intention. It's a social and domestic arrangement and there was no intention. Now, the evidence is, I mean, the evidence shows him as being pretty slimy, really. He's made a lot of promises. He's got his solicitor to then come in. His solicitor's kind of raked some of them back. They go backwards and forwards. There's a lot of oral evidence and a few emails and bits and pieces. So there are some issues in relation to the certainty piece as well and exactly what the promises were. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, this is, a, again, a very good example of somebody wanting not wanting to keep a promise that was made and as a consequence demonstrating that there was no contract. But again, it's an excellent question because it reminds us to pair back at what point in time are these things relevant. So it was, would have been trying to get out of the contract trying to, or agreement, trying to demonstrate that there is no agreement, they could have gone for, well, the consideration. And, so there, and the consideration point here comes out is, well, her consideration was effectively foregoing the opportunity to have sex for money with other people. It's like a business, yeah. So, and, you know, and, and the courts were uncomfortable with that. But at the end of the day, that's a business arrangement. I mean, you know, like, okay, it's like a business arrangement that, you know, we might all be concerned about at a range of levels, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, us throwing another level of judgment over it creates another issue. Tom, are you, you, have, you have to remind me of your name too. Edie. Edie. Yeah. So from a consideration point of view, it's, yeah. Exactly. So consideration is not an issue that they... But then that's why I find the judgment itself offensive. It's because there's no need to deal with the consideration point, the immorality point in that way. I mean, yeah, she was an escort. She was a sex worker. Um, but that's still her line of work. Like that is her line of work. It's like, it's not illegal. Yeah. Um, it's... It, what would, you know, there's no inference that she was doing that illegally. Um, it's, yeah, it's, there is this moral overtone in the judgment that I personally find. I'm, I'm being moral about the moral overtone. I recognise the irony there too. Steph, thank you for wearing a name tag, but I remembered your name. <laughs> um, yeah, just on, I, like, I, I think I read this. Heated agreement. Yeah, um, and it obviously depends on whether you wanted to go to the high court, but there's one more. Yeah. Well, she, the, the thing is, I, for the reasons I was expressing before, I, I think it would be very difficult to get leave to appeal here on the law, on the points of law. Um, again, not a litigator, so I'm, I'm looking at it on the points of law. It's a, it's a really good case for a summary of how intention works in a modern context. I personally find the approach that's taken in part, and I've, I've reproduced it there, I find that, well, a combination of unnecessary and repugnant. But then again, I'm being very open with you as to what my views are, and there may well be many of you who disagree with my views, and a number of you have, have been agreeing with me, so it's difficult for those people to, um, to say otherwise. I mean, at the end of the day, judges are just people. And people are flawed. I don't think the legal reasoning is flawed, actually. Um, again, there's some evidence issues that, in the case, it's like it's an interesting read. It's worth having a look at. Should yeah, should have got a good lawyer, I say. <laughs> well, and he did have a good lawyer who was trying to eat back. So this was part of it because I think there's, you know, the people around him are like, "What are you doing, making promises like this for? That's unnecessary." But again. Everything we know about contract is private laws. Court doesn't inquire into whether it's a good deal or not. It might be completely unnecessary. 
in the scheme of things, it's tiny money compared to what this man was worth or what it cost to litigate this, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, I, and that's why I like throwing this case into the mix. Um, because I think it does show us that these somewhat antiquated, in some ways they feel antiquated ideas, uh, can still be very current. You have to remind me too, I'm sorry. Ash. Ash. Um, I would think that this is obiter. I would think of that as obiter in this case. Um, there is, it, it, it is consistent with the very old cases in this space. But since Irma Genus, I think it's quite clear, the High Court has been quite clear that those cases have very little weight, really. They just go to the presumptions and the onus of proof. Um, and again, I like that language in Irma Genus where they say the law shouldn't ossify. And this to me is an example of ossification um, that we, we, you know, we can move forward. But look, I don't, I don't want to criticise the law on it. In fact, when I first read this case, I sort of wasn't, I was reading for the law. I wasn't looking at the bigger picture of it. I know, can you imagine that, where you only just read extracts and you read the paragraphs you're interested in? And then when I put it in context, I was quite conflicted about do I throw this into the mix or not? But I think it actually is a good case to think about how these things can fall through. And also think about actually how bargaining power is... We do live in contract law in this kind of unreal, under this unreal assumption that in commercial arrangements that there is an equality of bargaining power. And like this is clearly not a con consumer contract in that, in that sense and there's legislation that takes care of consumers but we have an inequality of bargaining power here. And he had lawyers. Um, but, but where does this actually fit? I'm so glad for that extra 55 minutes. I'm so sorry to be a bit all over the place today. I just, I genuinely thought we only had that 20 minutes and I was so much better off than I thought. So clearly I did not follow the slides in the order that they were in, but I did them in uh, area of importance. I hope you've enjoyed your Saturday as much as I've enjoyed mine. And for those of you at home, you are probably better off listening to the desk lectures, but there you go. Um, Questions, concerns, frustrations. Otherwise, I will see you all on Monday night. Yay!